And most of the revolutions in Europe and in the world have been mere changes of management. Let us make certain that the next time a change is made, that it not only be a change in management, but the struggle will break through all the ruling classes and that the end result will be that the workers and small farmers of the, of the country will be, will, will be the rulers of this place and will create a new structure, a new superstructure, and a new kind of world, a new kind of Ireland. In September 1934, disaffected former members of the IRA met in Mines Town Hall, along with trade unionists, communists and socialists of all stripes, to discuss the formation of a new revolutionary force in Irish politics. They believed that socialism was the key to success for the republican movement, that creating a republic that wasn't also socialist would simply mean exchanging one master for another. The IRA has always had a strong left-wing current within it. This current often breaks out into the open, usually with a split in the movement. These splits into left and right wings of the IRA often occur at times of great change in Irish society, changes that directly impact on the IRA and the very reasons for its being. In 1930, the IRA adopted Ser Era, a radical political programme that attempted to link the centuries-old national question with social questions. According to the Ser Era Manifesto, the aim was the establishment of an independent revolutionary leadership for the working class and working farmers, the overthrow of British imperialism and its ally, Irish capitalism. To the church and the Cumann and Gael, this all reeked of communism. Senior government figures like Ernest Blight and W.T. Cosgrave denounced Ser Era, and they were also condemned from the pulpit. The IRA ultimately abandoned the Ser Era programme, perhaps fearful of the heat that radical politics brought to bear on the organisation. By 1934, the IRA was in something of an existential crisis, questioning its own path and the future of its organisation. This crisis was brought about by the coming to power of a Republican government, a Fianna Fáil government, only two years previously. In March 1932, Eamon de Valera formed the first Fianna Fáil government, following a general election a month earlier. The elections had been ruthless, with the outgoing government attempting to label de Valera's party as communistic. The IRA had actively canvassed for the new party in many parts of Ireland, believing that the election of those who had opposed the Treaty of 1922 would bring about a new political climate. However, there were many in the IRA who weren't happy with this. They believed that de Valera would not bring about a republic, and that he had essentially abandoned republicanism by entering the Free State Parliament. On the one hand, the election of Fianna Fáil was welcomed because one of the first things that Fianna Fáil did was release all the Republican prisoners that were being held in the state, including people like Frank Ryan and George Gilmore. And then also there was a period which was really a honeymoon period in which the IRA could organise openly. And its membership actually surged during 1932 as several thousand young men joined the IRA and also women came in to come on the man and they were able to parade and, 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 and operate openly. But there was problems from the start in that as Moss Toomey, the IRA's chief of staff, put it, nobody visualised a free state which we weren't supposed to attack, but now there is one. So how are they going to deal with Fianna Fáil in power? On the left, people like Pater O'Donnell and George Gilmore and increasingly Frank Ryan were angry that the IRA's shift to the left seemed to have been halted by the election of Fianna Fáil. They wanted the Ser Era programme revived. Politically, really, it, it leads a lot of its officers to, to reconsider their position within the organisation. So strong was the fear of being associated with anything at all left-wing that the IRA issued a general standing order forbidding its members from taking part in social agitation. The Catholic Church, the, particularly the hierarchy, were the ideological stormtroopers uh, for Irish capitalism. Capitalism which was, as I said before, was very politically very weak and economically very weak. And uh, so anti-communism um, became the actual uh, the core element in the attack against um, left and Republican forces in the late 20s and early 30s. The whole tradition, whether it was in Russia 
and uh, or Spain of the church being associated with the powerful upper classes. It was a different uh, situation in Ireland as it was a different situation in, in Poland in that the uh, priests and people were united in, 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 in social struggles. The Soviet Union uh, wasn't overly critical of, of the Catholic Church until Stalin um, imposed then re severe restrictions on religion and around 1929. And that then sort of spreads its way across Europe. The Vatican reacts to that um, and the Irish Church follows that line. And that's accompanied then by government and coercive legislation in order to combat this supposed communist threat. Um, so that's, that's really where it comes from, even though the Communist Party is quite small and the amount of radicals is a, is a small enough element in Irish society. Um, the establishment, the church, the government, the media, uh, it's in their interests to promote this idea of reds under the bed. Regardless of the anti-communism of the period, there were many in the IRA who believed that the organisation had to involve itself in social struggles. They believed that the path to a socialist republic was the correct one for the organisation. Their journey would ultimately bring them here to the Mines Town Hall and the first national conference of the Republican Congress. Those IRA members that came here in the autumn of 1934 were walking away from an organisation they'd spent most of their adult lives in. They had fought for it, killed for it and been jailed for it. But by coming here to Ratmines, they knew there was no way back into the organisation for them. Just who were these IRA members here in Ratmines and what motivated them to come here? One of them was Padre O'Donnell. In 1930, Garda intelligence felt compelled to warn that the extremist movement in this country was a mix of political revolutionaries and social revolutionaries. Certainly, Padre O'Donnell was just the type of intellectual that the state was worried about. A very capable writer and journalist, O'Donnell was a veteran of the anti-treaty IRA, who had been imprisoned in Mount Joy alongside Liam Mellows. O'Donnell, a proud Donegal man by birth, had attempted to push radical social politics inside the IRA for many years. He lost a much publicised libel case against a Catholic magazine that claimed he attended the Lenin College in Moscow. But in truth, O'Donnell's socialism owed more to James Connolly than to the calm intern. Also in the room was Limerick man Frank Ryan a former editor of Unfublocked, a language rights activist, and a man renowned as a street fighting man. Like O'Donnell, he had attempted to introduce radical politics into the IRA, and he would later find his place in Republican folklore as the man who led Irishmen to the trenches of the Spanish Civil War. Though too young to have taken part in the War of Independence, he was active in the anti-treaty IRA. He joined the East Limerick Brigade just before the truce in July 1921. Ryan had huge um, respect throughout the IRA because he led from the front, he was right throughout the 1920s, he eventually became commander of, of the IRA's Dublin Brigade, um, someone who took a lead in part in confrontations with um, the British Legion, with the Gardaí, later on with the Blue Shirts, um, someone who, who was served hard time in prison you know, uh, as well um, in 1931. But Ryan was also a thinker, I mean Ryan had written He'd been editor of Unfublocked, he'd written quite a lot in the Irish language in particular about politics. And again, he's somebody who, who wasn't automatically a socialist. He'd, his ideas had changed between 1931 and 1933. He'd become more left-wing. He'd been influenced by the arguments of O'Donnell and Gilmore. Ryan was also active in Cunner and Aguelga. For him, the ultimate aspiration was the vision of Porrick MacPierce. In Ireland, neo on ser a Gaelic come on. Not only free, but Gaelic as well. From the time of its inception, the Republican Congress faced opposition from a wide variety of sources. On one hand, you had the IRA, hostile to an organisation that included many former comrades. You had the Blue Shirts, naturally opposed to any manifestation of socialism in Irish society, but most importantly, undoubtedly, was the Catholic Church, incredibly hostile to communism in the early years of the 1930s. Now, in March 1933, a year before the Republican Congress, a large crowd gathered here on Great Strand Street and laid siege to Connolly House, headquarters of the Revolutionary Workers Group. They had gathered outside the pro-cathedral and were mainly members of the St. Patrick's Anti-Communist League.
The revolutionary workers' groups were a forerunner of the Communist Party of Ireland, many of whom's members would go on to join the Republican Congress. In 1933, the revolutionary workers' groups had their offices here at 64 Great Strand Street, ironically today the site of an evangelical Christian church. Now, many of the crowd who laid siege to Connolly House in 1933 were inspired by fiery sermons in the pro-cathedral, where priests and bishops routinely denounced the evils of international communism. This despite the fact communism was, and has historically remained since, incredibly weak in Irish society. The monster of communism is amongst us in Dublin. You cannot be a Catholic and a communist. One stands for Christ, the other for Antichrist. If you meet an individual whom you know to be a communist, attack him. For if you don't, he will soon be burning your churches. A crowd of between five and 6,000 people were involved in the attack on Connolly House. The building was actually under siege for three nights straight. And on the final night, Wednesday the 29th of March, the rioters succeeded in fighting off the defenders. The building was torched and those inside were forced to flee across the rooftops to safety. Among those attacking the building was Bob Doyle, who ironically would go on to become a socialist himself and he was one of the last Irish survivors of the Spanish Civil War. Doyle recalled the first night of the Great Strand Street attack vividly in his memoirs, remembering that a Jesuit preacher in the pro-cathedral had told them that here, in the holy city of Dublin, the vile creatures of communism are within our midst. He remembered that the crowd gathered a thousand strong outside the cathedral, singing religious hymns like Faith of Our Fathers. On Footlocked, the newspaper of the Irish Republican Army condemned what happened here in Great Strand Street as the action of Hitlerists. It said that Hitlerism is a disease which until now has appeared to be confined to the European continent and it will spread in Irish society unless it is rudely checked. The crowd were not satisfied only with the destruction of Connolly House and the following night turned their attention to the Workers' College on Eccles Street. The following night, after the burning of Connolly House, the mob descended on the home of Madame Despard. She lived here on Eccles Street in the north inner city. Despard had given her home over to be used as a workers' college. She was, however, a very unlikely radical, the sister of Lord John French, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland during the War of Independence, and a man who the IRA had came very, very close to killing. She was a leading activist in the Irish Friends of Soviet Russia and the Revolutionary Workers Group, so she made an obvious target for the anti-communist mob. She was a very well-regarded um, political mover and a suffrage. There's a street in London called after her. Like she, was, she, was, she was a really important person in terms of politics. And she was openly involved with the socialist movement, with the movement of the left, and she was practically run out of the country for being a communist. What occurred here on Eccles Street was the culmination of days of anti-communist violence. However, the result would be very different by comparison to what had happened at Connolly House. Unbeknownst to the attackers, there was major refurbishment work going on at the Eccles Street building. And that meant that the defenders of the building were well armed with a plentiful supply of bricks and other projectiles. Several windows were broken by the mob, however. That this building was attacked makes sense from the point of view of the mob. It was used by the Irish Friends of Soviet Russia. It was also a workers' college. And the connection between Echo Street and Connolly House is very clear. However, it's important to say that the Freemasons Hall and Trinity College Dublin were also attacked, indicating a spirit of militant Catholicism among the mob. Opposition to communism in Dublin at this time was so great that a few months on from these riots, the Communist Party of Ireland held meetings at Leinster Street in a room booked under a false name, the Dublin Total Abstinence Association. Mostly, I think if you're looking at the Irish situation, you've got things like, most notably, the, the Eucharistic Congress in 1932. Someone described it as a combination of sort of Italia 90 and the Pope's visit. Like, it was, it was huge and it was something that people were genuinely swept up in. And there's this combination of the, the religious and the political together, which are just a, a very powerful force. And anyone coming up against that is going to have to fight very cleverly and fight very hard to, uh, to overcome that. And the idea that uh, socialism or communism is a bad thing is obviously, um, it doesn't begin in 1931 or 1932. I mean, Connolly had to fight that the whole time when, when he was in, in Dublin and he, he had running battles with the church over whether you could be a good 
a good Catholic and a good socialist at the same time. And that was one of the things he was always up against. So in the 1930s, you have that, but you have that uh, in a more uh, vicious kind of way than you ever had before. And the viciousness is, is clearly evident in the streets when you get things like the attack on Connolly House in, in 1933. Following on from the attacks in March 1933, Gardy noted that the crowd who gathered outside Connolly House included, quote, a large body of respectfully dressed young women. The left has tended to blame anti-communism in this period on animal gangs, shadowy groups of hooligans and thugs from the north inner city tenements. However, it's clear, looking at the facts, anti-communism held a broad appeal across various social classes in Dublin. Against the backdrop of this intense violence, it's incredible that anyone would want to persevere, but persevere they did, and the left of the IRA argued it was time to go back to the policies of Ser Era, which had been abandoned in the face of church opposition. To do this, however, they would need a majority, and to get that majority, they would go to the IRA Army Convention of 1934.